1. I worked in the service industry for around four years after leaving university, and it truly was the worst job I have ever had to do. However, I did get to meet some interesting characters throughout my experience, and after reading a ton of posts, I felt the need to share about one of the weirdest and absolute worst managers I have ever had in my entire life. He was literally something out of a sitcom. Let me introduce you to the wonderful world of Poland Drunk. Not his real name, but similar phonetically. I had just left university, and after a brief stint in France as an au pair, I had moved back to my hometown in the provincial backwater of the east of England. I was planning to go do a postgrad course, so I just needed a job to tide me over in the interim. Unfortunately, I grew up in a really quiet area. Most of the population are over 60, and it's not exactly teeming with job opportunities. So finding anything was really difficult. I had almost completely lost hope when I received an interview for a restaurant, wine bar, inn, in the middle of town. Now this place didn't have a great reputation, but I didn't have that much choice, so I jumped at the chance of getting hired as front of house staff and went along to the interview, which was at 12 o'clock the following day. I arrived at the interview feeling keen and was welcomed by a charming Italian woman, the girlfriend of the owner, Carmen. She asked me a couple of questions about my experience, very little as waiting staff, but I had worked for three years in a large supermarket, so I had experience in a customer-facing environment. And then in came Poland Drunk. Poland was a pigeon-chested, fairly attractive older man in his 60s, with grey hair and a kind of aloof expression that can only really be described as a permanent resting bitch face. He looked me up and down and said, Good, you're not fat. I was kind of surprised by this, but brushed it off as just being a strange quirk. Have you done anything like this before? I explained that I had worked in retail for a few years, and that I would be able to commit to around three months of employment should I get hired, because I was planning to continue my studies at a later date. Huh. So do you like the arts? Yes, I actually have an English literature degree, and I'm interested in making comics. Good. We want someone cultured. We're very cultured in here. Yes, I replied eagerly. Yes, I love the arts, actually. I'm a graphic designer, you see. And I do photography. I'm very good at photography. All very highbrow stuff. I like my staff to be like that. Don't want to give a green light to the riffraff. Okay. You know, we show a film every day on the TV in the foyer. Only really quality stuff. Art out cinema. Oh, that's great. Suddenly realizing why there had been a very explicit gay sex scene being shown on the TV as I came into the restaurant. I had initially thought it was a mistake. It turned out Poland had been showing one of his art house films. I was a little confused by his art spiel. I was also confused that neither Carmen nor Poland seemed to be attending to the customers that were sitting and waiting to be served. There weren't many of them so I assumed they were going to wait on them once the interview was over. Okay, you're hired. I smiled and got up to shake his hands, getting confused when I noticed that he was putting on his coat. I also noticed that Carmen is putting on her coat. They both appeared to be leaving when the restaurant was otherwise devoid of waiting staff, and there were a few customers sitting and staring expectantly. We're going out for a bit. You can start now. I stared at him. I should have just walked out there and then. But I really needed a job, and I cannot emphasize enough just how few jobs there were going in this goddamn rural void. I, 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 I don't know how to work the till. I don't know the menu. Is there someone to help me? It's not bloody rocket science! And are you going back to university? Ask the chefs if you have any trouble. Ciao! Carmen called as she followed him out the door. Uh, excuse me, can we order some drinks? Asked an elderly gentleman. And so began three hours of trying to work out how to operate the till, how to prepare drinks, learn menu items, check in hotel guests, take reservations, all whilst having absolutely no idea what I was actually supposed to be doing. 
I was almost in tears when Poland and Carmen waltzed in through the doors. How was it? I didn't know what I was doing and you left me on my own? Poland looked around the restaurant. Everyone seems alright. That's because lunch ended half an hour ago. I had to go to the dry slopes. Poland was an avid dry slope skier, and he simply couldn't miss his bi-weekly visits to the dry slopes in the city. Suddenly his eyes fell on the sofa. There's a reserved sign. What reserved sign? The reserved sign on the sofa. Oh, I thought it had been put there by accident. I realized that he was referring to the triangular metal sign that was on one of the sofas by the fire. There were two, opposite each other, and adjacent to a large exposed fireplace. I moved it behind the bar. Poland was visibly irritated. Are you stupid? He went behind the bar and picked up the sign, placing it on the sofa closest to him. Don't you know anything about sofa etiquette? What do you mean? <sighs> sofa etiquette. Kit. We have to put a reserve sign on one of the sofas in case two people come in and they sit on opposite sofas. What will we do if another person comes in and they can't sit on a sofa by themselves? I suppose they could ask the other person to move, or they could just sit next to. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. He pointed at the sofa. You must always put the reserve sign on one of the sofas. I do not want to see anything like this again. It was difficult stifling my laughter, but I managed it. Hell, I managed it for the three whole long arduous months that I worked in that fucked up place. Okay, Poland. Sure. I later found out that the previous reserved signs had been made out of wood, but after numerous customers had thrown it defiantly into the fireplace, he had decided to change it to metal. I've got so many more stories about this guy, sometimes I can't believe that someone like that could actually exist. Generally, customers were alright. And it was never all that busy because he had such a bad reputation in the town. In later years, before he was eventually forced to shut down the business, he received one of the worst views ever in the Daily Mail. I laughed so hard. 2. I'm a busser at a laid-back but very social steakhouse. We give out stones that are 755 degrees to tables, along with their choice of steak or seafood. They can cook it at their table. Along with a side plate for every guest, a new cup for every refill, coasters, lots of kids, and grease flying everywhere. Every appetizer has some unique plate, and there's probably six side bowls per table every time. And cups don't go into a dish pit so I have to bring dishes to two different locations. You can imagine how hard my job is as a busser, considering we aren't allowed to use any sort of transportation method for the dishes, except our hands and a tiny tub. With that being said, there's usually three times the amount of dishes and trash at tables than there would be at any other restaurant I've worked at. My problem starts here. In my opinion, it's completely ridiculous. Servers pre-bus, but only to their convenience. They only move stones and plates when they need to make room for more food coming to the table. And they don't take dishes to pit, nor do they hand the dishes to me. They decide they're too busy to walk 40 feet to the pit, it's a small restaurant, and decide to leave the dishes either on a cart in the middle of the dining room or at the server station. They don't come back for them, and they don't ask me to take them. They just sit there in view for all the guests to stare at. We aren't allowed to use carts, so they shouldn't be using them for dirty dishes, considering we bring out fresh food on the same carts. And the server station bullshit? I've worked in four fast-paced restaurants, and not one server has ever been too lazy to bring their dishes into the pit in a rush. Along with their dirty tables, that are stacked full with dirty dishes. Do they want me to pick up their mess that they leave everywhere? Or do they want their fucking tables flipped? Because I can't do them both at the same time, especially when it takes 10 minutes minimum in dish pit, because of how much shit there is because they don't pre-bus unless it's stones or side plates. The most infuriating part is, they walk up to a table that had just left, search through the rubble for the receipt with their tip on it, take it, and leave. 
The servers make 400 minimum on a busy night. I get tipped out $70 for a week's worth of cleaning up their mess. Is this normal? Am I overreacting? Or am I totally sane for thinking that these are the laziest servers in the industry? And the most greedy, $70 total for the week. From 20 different servers that have made over $1,500 that week. Come on! I have a kid to feed and I do it 80% by myself. I haven't slept in four days. And when I work, I just get pushed around like a nobody. And when I get home, I have nothing to show for the hard work I do, but the servers who I slave for and cover their ass for go home or to the bars with four to $700 in their pocket, depending on the night. It's depressing, embarrassing, and most of all, just downright unfair. I wasn't even able to buy Christmas presents this year. I've been in restaurants for four years, and I'm 18. I've been lead cook, host for one and a half years, dishwasher, busser, food runner, expo, you name it, and I've done it. Except serving because of my age. And because of that, my managers and fellow co-workers think that since I'm a busser and have no serving experience, that I'm a dumbass. I want to quit, but I also want to serve and make that damn money. I hope you guys pre-bus, and if you're too busy to do so, help your damn bussers. 3. So I was waiting on a man and woman in their late 30s or early 40s last night. He came in first, orders two glasses of Pinot Noir for himself and her, and she arrives a bit later. They have two or three glasses of wine over about an hour and a half, check out, then want another so I open a new check, they close out, then want another so I do the same thing. She pays for their last drink that was still on its way, and I can tell she's a little tipsy but she generally seemed fine communicating. Got her credit card out, filled out her email for the receipt, etc. I was going to make sure they were both not driving home, but other than that I had no worries. Overall, they order about four or five glasses over three hours. As I'm around their table doing closing side work, the man calls me over and I see the woman slumped over totally unconscious. I obviously check her pulse quick, make sure she's breathing, then try to see about waking her up, shake her shoulder gently, pinch her hand, etc., and no response. The whole time the man is trying to put a glass of water to her lips, despite the fact that she's totally out. I recommend to him strongly that we call someone and he adamantly tells me not to, saying to grab an ice pack and that he would wake her up himself. I again strongly recommend that we call someone but end up going to grab my manager and asking about an ice pack. Long story short, this guy comes over and starts blabbing about how he's a multi-millionaire and can't deal with his headache. Then tells my manager, who's calling another more senior manager to see what to do, explicitly not to call anyone else, and especially not to call the police. At this point, his blatant selfishness and narcissism is absolutely pissing me off. So I tell him the obvious fact that her safety is our top priority, and that we are going to do whatever we need to do to make sure she gets the help she needs. She ends up very faintly waking up about ten minutes later, but would not open her eyes and would only sometimes respond with a nod or a shake of her head to my questions. The cops and medical squad arrive, take her out on a stretcher as she starts crying, gets the man's information, and leaves with her. He sits down and starts making a bunch of phone calls, comes up to me and tries to talk to me and make sure everything is cool, it was not, and then leaves about 15 minutes later once his ride arrives. What the fuck happened here? Was she drugged? Have a medical emergency. I'm a bit worried that I overserved her, but I talked to my manager who checked my tickets, and she said there wasn't any way they were overserved. Very confused. 4. I recently changed jobs and started working for one of the major craft beer breweries in my city. I've always been a huge fan of their beers, always wanted to work for them, and never made that a secret. Two months ago, they finally reached out because they needed a new manager for their taproom, brewery. A role I could not dream of even a few years ago, but I finally got there. 
I was sad about leaving my old team behind because working with them was like slipping into a warm bath. Had inside jokes with everyone, knew everyone and their moms, so to say, knew all the regulars and what they liked. In my last two weeks there, I almost decided not to transfer because I was a little scared I would lose it all. The new team, though being friendly and welcoming, were quite reserved, understandably, as they have the same I had at the place I left and are afraid of losing it. I've been trying my best to be as accommodating, open, and friendly with them, but of course it takes more than just that to win people over. My chance came in the form of a male Karen. See, the way the taproom is laid out is pretty simple. Split a large building in half with a glass wall. Put the brewery at one side, the other side in the taproom. But a bar in the middle of it. With two sets of ten taps on the terrace side, busiest side, and one on the other side, the quiet side. Ideally, we have three bartenders, so three bars. I refer to a set of taps as a bar, open. This was the case in the beginning when Mel Karen arrived. He was there with about five friends, so six in total. They took a seat at the back of the tap room on the quiet side and were able to get their beers there. At some point, it got too busy to have three bars open with three bartenders. We needed either four or man two bars with three bartenders. As the cook was out sick, I was manning the kitchen, which has a view of the bar. They closed one bar and made people queue up at the other two. When I ran downstairs to grab some kitchen stuff, Karen asked me for a word. He explained that he was told to line up at the other side of the bar, because this side was now closed. He mentioned how much money he had spent and felt like he didn't have to line up. I explained to him that if this bar was closed, he did indeed need to line up. The fact that he had spent money here didn't mean he would get special treatment. Everyone is spending money. About half an hour later, he appears in the kitchen window, now visibly drunk and pissed off. He again complained that he wasn't served at the back bar. I explained it was closed and he needed to line up. He used the blood-boiling argument of, Who's paying your salary? Is it me? Who has spent almost 200 euro? Or is it the barman who doesn't want to serve me? Now I've had it with this dude. Sir, my employer and owner of this company pays my salary. Your 200 euro keeps the lights on just for today. That's it. If you think you get special treatment for spending 200 euros, you're at the wrong place. If my staff tells you to line up, you line up. If they decide that's how it's best to run the bar, I support that. Either line up or leave. He looked at me and said, Okay, then I know enough, I know enough! And walked off. A few minutes later, I see him behind the bar talking to one of my bartenders. Behind the fucking bar! I fly out of the kitchen, grab him by his arm and neck and yell, Out! 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 As I steer him towards the door. One of his friends follow us and asks what's up. I ask him to gather their mates and stuff and leave. This gentleman has acted past his welcome. He didn't seem to argue, but they all left anyway. After checking on the bar team, who were all fine, I ran back into the kitchen, which was now backed up. After work, we all had a drink together to evaluate the day, and one of the girls remarked how cool and good it was that I did. She said she didn't know what to do with this guy, and that he had been behind the bar before I saw him. She said the previous manager would let things slide, and would probably have given the man a round on the house. And that was why she and they didn't come to me to ask for help. She had some other people there remark that my actions made them feel safer and more appreciated. Especially when I said if they decided to do it that way, I support it. Those final few words made me feel good about making the decision to move there, and made me feel more optimistic about my future with the already great team. 5. Few years ago, I worked in a very popular local bakery as a barista. It was a great job at first, but a series of bad managerial hires eventually made it unbearable. This story happens at the end of my time there, when it had all gone to shit. 
I was good with the espresso machine, and several regulars always requested me specifically to make their drinks just how they liked. One such regular was known universally in the bakery as Latte Larry. It's been quite a while since I worked there, but I still remember his order. Four pumps of caramel, skim milk, as hot as you can get it. Lottie Larry was a bit of a problem for us up front of house staff. He was good friends with the owners and he tipped very generously. But he'd always call his orders in just before closing. This was annoying because by that time most of the coffee area had to be shut down for the night. We all dreaded the ringing of the telephone at five minutes to five. Also importantly for this story, Latte Larry was a massive creep. He was in his 70s. He'd constantly hit on the teenage cashiers. He barely ever made eye contact, preferring instead to stare openly at girls' chests. He'd always try to touch our hands as we passed him his mocha or his change. If a dude was working the register or the coffee counter, he'd joke around with them and make suggestive comments about the girls. It was really fucking gross. And I reported his shit behavior several times to management, but was brushed off and essentially told to grin and bear it. I was younger and less wise and backboned in those days, so I complied, laughing lamely at his jokes and ignoring everything else. This doormat behavior of mine did not last for long, however. By the last month of my employment at the bakery, I basically knew I was going to get fired. I had missed two days of work because of a flare-up of a chronic illness earlier in the month, and despite the fact that I'd found coverage for both days, I was written up for it and told I'd be terminated if I missed another day. I did not know back then that this was very illegal. At that time, one of my relatives was very sick and their health was rapidly declining, so I knew another absence was unavoidable. Like hell I was going to work when they died. I was also in the process of planning an international move and I was working another, almost full-time job. To say I was stressed beyond belief and 1000% done is an understatement. Enter Latte fucking Larry. I'm closing alone, there are other people around, but they're all bakers sequestered in a separate building in the back of the property. Latte Larry calls as usual two fucking minutes before close this time. Make the milk extra hot, it's cold outside. I make his stupid drink, fervently praying that it scalds his shitty tongue off. He strolls into the store, all jovial and skeevy. He decides he wants something sweet with his drink, and orders one of the enormous slices of bobka. I go get it with a wax paper sheet, but it's awkward and slippery, so I switch to gloves. Prone as I am to talking to myself in public when stressed out of my goddamn gourd, I make the mistake of muttering, whoops, this is a job for two hands. To which, Latte. Fucking Larry. In his punny, pervy, pebble of a brain, thinks it is appropriate to reply with, oh, You can give me a hand job anytime. For the first time in my entire life, the debilitating anxiety that has plagued me since birth, and which I am now heavily medicated for fucking evaporates like pure grain alcohol on a Saharan sand dune. It is replaced by a cold, hard, scalpel-sharp rage that I have never felt before or since. I forget that I am a young woman alone in the building with this asshole. I forget that I'm a five-foot-two hipster with fibromyalgia, standing up to a Vietnam veteran built like a brick shithouse. I forget that if I sass him, the owner will chew my ass off and fire me. I forget that I need this paycheck for plane tickets. I drop the bobka, stand up straight, and stare dead into the latte fucking lard stupid face, in a voice that rings with the fury and conviction of someone who has had enough. I say the only remotely cool-headed thing I will ever say in my awkward, nerdy existence. Maybe think before you speak next time. For some reason, this not very threatening comeback that I stole from a RuneScape meme apparently puts the fear of God into this creep. I think maybe it's 
just that no one had ever called him on his shit before, and he didn't know what to do. Looking severely freaked out, he throws down a 20 on the counter and quickly exits the store, clutching his comfort latte to his chest. He forgets the bobka and his change, so I make the unauthorized executive decision to put the money in the communal tip jar and the bobka into my face. I calmly finish up closing, go home, and have a panic attack. I was fired a week later after my relative passed, and I called out to be with my family. But at least I didn't ever see Latte Larry again. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Spinning Plates, episode 162. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you enjoyed the video, then I would appreciate it if you share it around. Gotta get them views up, and uh, I think it's working, because view numbers seem a little higher. So thank you very much to everyone who has been sharing the videos. Uh, I appreciate it, and I hope you continue to do so. Alright, let's see. Uh, this is the day of Saturday. <sighs> Sorry, I'm sitting cross-legged. Dead leg, dead leg. Don't like that. No, very bad, very bad, very bad. Uh, Saturday, we should have a gaming stream uh, later tonight. Well, I call them gaming streams. The games happen. It's more of a community stream, really, isn't it? Just as a way of sitting down and spending time with y'all. Uh, did I say y'all? I, apparently, I became, I became, I became a southern gentleman, or possibly a lady, at that point. Um, but yes, it's a good, it's a good way to spend time with people. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.